This is the OnePlus Open. It's the first ever OnePlus foldable, and honestly, the first OnePlus product in the last five years that's really impressed me. See, foldable phones up until this point, for most people, including myself, haven't really made sense. You pay more money, almost double the price of a flagship, to get a phone that has a bigger screen, yes, but then is compromised in almost every other way. In terms of comfort, they're very thick when folded. In terms of cameras, they struggle to fit good ones in. You get hinge problems, you get crease problems, you get dust stuck in your screen problems. There's like 50 more examples of this. But this OnePlus Open, is different. You can tell it's not just trying to be yet another company's take at the same thing, but actually the foldable done right. Paying attention to all of the pain points you normally get and actually trying to fix them. So let's talk about it. The unboxing is a good start. You get everything you need with it, which shouldn't be a surprise for a $1,699 phone, but that's just where we are right now. The phone's on top, and that is a proper camera crater. You get a 67 watt fast charger. It is starting to feel a little dated that it's a traditional USB-A plug and not USB-C though. And then a second really heavy box. There's a case included for both the back and the front. It's nothing crazy fancy, but it is all the protection that 90% of people are gonna need. And then inside, a cable, classic OnePlus Red, and then welcome, membership, card, quick guide, and then a safety guide. Why is the safety guide like 60 pages? What is this, like 1995? <laughs> and then a SIM eject tool. Time for the big peel. Now, this hasn't been one of those experiences where I've had to dig to find the differences. While it still looks and feels familiar if you've seen a foldable before, the improvements to the foldable formula are really obvious. The first thing you'll notice is how slim and light it is, mostly thanks to new materials in the body like titanium instead of steel. Is it the most comfortable phone I've ever held? Hell no. But is it close enough to feeling like a normal phone that you could just maybe forget? Yeah. I'd say so. To give you some idea, this foldable with an 8-inch screen on the inside is actually the same weight as an iPhone 14 Pro Max, which I have carried around for a year with no problems. But that is not the only interesting thing going on here. The hinge. The hinge on foldable phones is both one of the biggest opportunities and potential vulnerabilities. And I'm just going to say it right now. This is the best hinge I've ever seen. It's very smooth. There's zero friction, but at the same time, at any point in the opening process, if you want to stop, you stop. And then according to OnePlus, it's also a lot more durable than any other hinge before. Thanks to being made from, no joke, exactly 69 parts, as opposed to most hinges which have over 100, and so they're saying are almost over-engineered. But there's more. The hinge makes for a basically gapless design all the way around when it's closed, which keeps dust and other substances out. But what's also kind of cool is that they've managed to do that while not making the hinge protrude outwards, and while also giving the screen enough space to rest when folded, such that it's not being pinched, and so when you unfold it, there is very, very very minimal crease. I've used a lot of foldable phones at this point, and in most cases the crease is just one of those side characters that you really dislike at the start and then you just kind of have to get used to always being around. But here, what you have is a screen with traces of a crease. It's minimal enough that if you choose to see it, you'll see it, but if you choose to ignore it, you absolutely can. And you're left with what genuinely does feel like a mini tablet on the inside. But the best bit, and the thing that really helps to sell this feeling, is this. The way that most foldables open is very gradually with a consistent amount of resistance until you basically decide, okay, this seems fully open, I'll stop pushing now. Which would probably be the way to do it if you sometimes use a foldable like this, sometimes like this, sometimes like this. But if we're being very honest, 95% of the time you use your foldable, really you're going to be in this position or you're going to be in this position. And that is why I really love the fact that this phone snaps into both of those positions. It's satisfying. It leaves no shadow of a doubt that you are in the fully open or fully closed position. And I suppose subconsciously, it also helps that feeling of distinction. Like, okay, I'm in phone mode. Now I'm in tablet mode. That's how I would make a foldable. There's also an alert slider, which used to be a classic OnePlus feature. They ditched it for a while and now it's finally back. So that's exciting. I mean, it's fine. It does what an alert slider does, but it did need to be about five centimeters lower for me to actually realistically reach it. There's IPX4 water resistance, which is good for splashes. So <laughs> Um, the point I was going to make, though, is that it's not rated for full-on immersion like Samsung's foldables are. And then the camera, which for some people I've showed this to, is massively annoying and intrusive. But for me, it's been okay. My fingers just kind of rest around it. And because it's at least centered and symmetrical, I found that it's got some but minimal wobble when I'm using it on my desk. So overall, the design is great. But design alone is not going to fix foldables. One of the biggest questions I and many people have is, how do you actually use the extra space you have in a way 
that actually makes this better than a normal phone. And the software on the OnePlus Open, I would say, is the most convincing answer to that question that I've ever seen. So the screen is this big, right? Well, think of it like it's actually this big. Meaning that while of course you can open an app and have it exist here, and then you can open another app and have it exist here, you can now also open an app and have it exist here. The apps will automatically open to whatever ratio makes the most sense for them, and not necessarily just what will fit your screen. And when you open a new one, it will just occupy a new area within this bigger virtual canvas. And the first time that I saw this, I just sat there nodding my head like, yes. A sudden moment of of course. This is how you get around the fact that you have a square display when most apps are designed for rectangles. This is how you make this bigger screen actually feel tangibly more useful. And this is how you multitask in a way that doesn't feel so formal and restrictive. And it's all assisted by this dock, which is your fixed apps that you set in the middle, your recent apps on the right, and then on the left, an app drawer. And the best bit, a recent files folder. So a combination of stuff like photos you've just taken and zip files you've just downloaded. And you don't really need to think about this dock. It's normal size when you're on the home screen, and then whenever you open an app, it just shrinks down. Just about still being useful without being an eyesore. And then if you've got a ton happening at once and you just want to get rid of it, you hold down and it goes. Now, if you're not coming from a foldable phone, there is still absolutely a learning curve here. But then when you get going, no foldable has ever made as much sense to me as this one right here. So here's an example use case from a couple of days ago. I was playing a game, and in that game, there's a bit of a wait time between rounds. So I thought, I'm going to use this time to find a new wallpaper. So two finger swiping down the middle will split the app and allow you to click on a different one to open alongside it. So I was playing the game while browsing for wallpapers until I found the perfect one that I was going to use. But then I thought, well, actually, I like the style of the wallpaper, but what would be even cooler is if I matched the color of that wallpaper to the color of this phone. So one tap on this dock, scroll to the recolor app, drag that into the fray, and now we've got all three apps open at once. And if I want to transfer the wallpaper to that recolor app, I literally just drop it in and we're away, editing. It all felt very seamless. But how is it possible? Partly the high-end Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset, partly the fact that you get 512 gigs of fast, fast storage, and largely due to the 16 gigabytes of top-end RAM you get here. This thing is basically the most well-equipped phone hardware that money can buy. Enough to run any single app you could possibly want when focusing on it, enough to run three fairly intensive applications at the same time, and then one more as a floating window. And then if you're only doing light work, enough to keep literally 40 apps open in the background at any one time. So almost nothing needs to reload when you open it later on. And in my testing, it's also able to do this while keeping cool. Thanks in part to a sheet of ultra-conductive graphene going across the body, which is not just good at getting heat from inside to the outside, but also heat from one side of the body to the other. It spreads it so that if one part of your phone gets really hot, it's effectively diluting that heat across the entire width of your phone, so it's less hot. Now, three pretty major caveats to this. One, if you're someone who even with this capability is still just going to be using one app at a time, which let's be honest, is probably still most people, then I don't think this is any more the phone for you as any other foldable. You'd be missing out on a lot of what's different about it. Two, that even with all of this power here, while it is very smooth when focusing on one thing, as soon as you start to juggle, the lag can creep in. Which I imagine is partly because it's really stretching the capability of what a phone chip is designed to do, but also partly that there's a lot of new stuff here and it needs optimizing on OnePlus's end. And then three, speaking of optimizing, in its current state, this is pretty buggy. Stuff like this, it happens often. I imagine it's because what OnePlus is allowing you to do is so wide open and freeform that it's very easy to run into situations that haven't been accounted for. I get it, but then spend more time accounting for it. And there's also quite a lot of things on the Android end that need work, like some apps that really should be supporting this whole drag and dropping of files between them, not supporting it. But okay, that should not completely take away from the fact that there is a lot to commend here. Like the fact that OnePlus only has one model of this phone that comes with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage by default. It's very easy to create a 128 gig model with eight gigs of RAM to make the advertised price seem way more affordable and then just incentivize upgrades, but they've just decided no, the full foldable experience requires this amount of RAM and storage. That's the minimum amount that we're gonna sell it with. And they're doing that while still undercutting the Samsung. The OnePlus Open is $16.99 versus Samsung $17.99, and that's for a phone that has 512 gigs of storage versus 256 and 16 gigs of RAM instead of 12. It's still very expensive, but at least you're getting the best of the best hardware for that price. These foldables right now, they are far too expensive for what they are. So even though I don't think we're quite there yet, at least this is putting some downwards pressure on that price. The 
actual software version here is Android 13 with OnePlus's Oxygen OS 13.2 on top of it. And it's got a nice level of customization. It's not the best I've ever seen, but definitely enough to make the phone yours. And it's just generally a well animated, nicely tactile experience. Any kind of list or web page you flick between, you don't just see it, you feel it. And you also can't not notice, putting aside the stability problems for a second, the core decisions being made for the day-to-day -day user experience, they are very focused around it just being intuitive. Like at the very start, I was struggling to reach the unlock pattern in the middle. Then I realized that these two buttons on either side, they move the user interface towards whichever hand is holding the phone. I felt like it was hard to press the power button and the volume buttons at the same time to take screenshots, but then realized that a quick swipe with three fingers, it does the same thing too. It does also do that whole thing where it remaps some apps when you're in the half-folded position. It's not as fleshed out as Samsung's flex mode, but for me, there's not really a huge use case for either. The main thing this needs is polish. And the fact that OnePlus is now promising four full years of major Android updates is promising. It's likely that they'll iron out the bugginess, but you can't guarantee it. So at this point, overall, the OnePlus Open is doing pretty well. And we haven't even talked about its crown jewel the cameras. The thing that OnePlus has really zeroed in on with the marketing here is that most foldable phones have compromised cameras. Basically, you have to fit those cameras into what's effectively half the depth of a normal flagship. And do you know what? They're not wrong about that. And what they're also not wrong about is that this phone, in response to that, is basically as kitted out as it gets. This Open has a triple camera, Hasselblad branded setup consisting of a 48 megapixel main camera, 48 megapixel ultra wide camera, and 64 megapixel three times telephoto camera. And megapixels are one thing, but these are also all large sensor cameras, like each respectively probably the biggest you can find in a foldable. And with the main camera, they're using a new pixel stacking technique that they're saying allows the phone to get in even more light than the number suggest. The pitch that OnePlus gave to me was basically that this is not just the best set of cameras on foldable, but that this is the best set of cameras on a smartphone. Now that's a pretty exciting prospect, and actually doubly exciting, because when you improve the cameras on a foldable, you're not just improving your rear photos, but your selfies too. Because on the front, you also have access to all three of these cameras in full quality. And in some ways, OnePlus has delivered. The ultrawide camera is great. In fact, I take better ultrawide shots on this than I do on my iPhone 15 Pro Max. The telephoto camera being a 64 megapixel camera means that while its optical zoom is only three times, you can actually go all the way to six times and still get a lossless 12 megapixel image. It still gives you that feeling of, oh, there's something really far away. Don't worry, my phone will be able to see it. Yeah, I was really excited about my veggie fingers. Now, they do advertise this as going up to 120X, um, ultra res zoom. But let me tell you, at 120x, this is anything but ultra res. And it's fine that it can't do this. No one's expecting it to. But can we please stop pretending like vast amounts of digital zoom is a selling point? The only potential exception to this is patterns. If you zoom in 120x to a pattern where the exact specifics of what you're shooting don't really matter, then the camera can do a really good job of almost drawing in the detail. That does not work for faces. I've taken some awesome selfies. Selfies that just wouldn't have been possible using basically any other phone, just from the fact that this folds. And it's all bundled together with some fairly pleasant color science, thanks to Hasselblad. The photos are a little darker than I'd have liked, but generally what's good is that you're never getting faces that are like tomato red or trees so green they look radioactive. It's quite grounded in reality. It's really good at resisting being overexposed on the main camera, and it sounds good. This is one of the nicest shutter experiences that I've had in recent memory. But you've probably realized where I'm going with this. I don't think it lives up to its potential. And it's not the hardware. The hardware's great. It's just OnePlus's camera software not being as intelligent as some of the competition. You'll notice it with portrait mode. It's not the best at chopping people's hair, for example. And it's super sensitive to movement and easy to blur if you're not still. And to be fair, with normal photos, you have an action mode, which is the exact opposite and actually really hard to blur. But it's just a shame that you can't have it all. I shouldn't have to go into an action mode to take photos that I can trust are blur free. And the ability to use AI to extract detail from your photos, which to me is one of the most important things, is not as good as the new iPhones by a long shot. And the video too is on the weaker end. Kind of like Samsung and like Google, this phone is quite susceptible to grain in conditions that aren't really that dark. And you'll also notice, especially when recording on either of the front cameras, which are the default for taking selfie video, 
they are quite easy to overexpose. The overall message here is that this is a good camera system. It's actually the best camera system on a foldable. It's just that OnePlus has definitely overshot with their claims, because what it definitely isn't is the best phone camera outright. The one unique thing that OnePlus has is X-Pan, which produces these super wide, very cinematic looking shots. It's a fun gimmick, and it even comes with its own shooting user interface, which is meant to mimic the traditional Hasselblad experience. But really all this is doing is taking a wide shot and chopping off the top and the bottom. At that point, I'd rather just take a panorama and get better quality. There's not much to say about the displays, apart from the fact that they are the creme de la creme of foldables. It bothers me slightly that the black bezel on this side is not symmetrical with the other bezels, but apart from that, they've nailed the ratio of width to height. So this is a 20 to 9 aspect ratio display, which is the exact same as the company's normal flagships. Both screens are super bright and using LTPO 3.0 tech, which means they can dial their refresh rate all the way up to 120Hz and then down to 10Hz on the front screen and 1Hz on the inside. They're extremely high resolution as well. The inside and outside screens have a pixel density of 431 and 426 pixels per inch, which, I mean, Samsung's inner screen is 373, so it's very high for a screen this big. The way they represent colors feels spot on to me, and not just at high brightness levels, which most screens are calibrated for, but even as you go dim, like watching YouTube videos at night, everything is preserved. And it also looks like OnePlus has paid some attention to longevity. There's a screen protector pre-fitted on both the inside and outside screens. The cover screen has a new type of more impact resistant glass they're calling ceramic guard. I wonder where that name came from. But then also OnePlus is saying that any wear and tear to the inner display protector within the warranty period, they'll do the repair for you, which I hope is them being generous and not them expecting there to be durability issues, but really there is no way of knowing that till we give it six months. What I can say for sure right now though, is that the battery took me off guard. The capacity is pretty unremarkable at 4,805 mAh, but OnePlus has really optimized here. Assuming you make some effort to make your battery last, you will have absolutely no problem getting to your second day. This thing does not go down easy, with actually really fast charging too. The included charger will have you at 100% in about 40 minutes, but more more importantly, 40% in about 10 minutes. The only caveat I would add to that is that, you know we talk about this idea of running four intensive applications at the same time? Yeah, I mean, if you do that all day, that can kill it, but it's good battery. Okay, last couple of things. There's a fingerprint scanner baked into the power button, and while it is able to work even when your fingers are a bit damp, I've not found it that reliable. I've had quite a lot of times where I'm kind of doing this. Yeah. <laughs> the phone has not a dual, but a triple speaker setup. There's one at the bottom and two at the top, which when I first heard about, I thought sounded like a transformative experience, but in reality, it's just good. It means you're quite likely at any given time to be covering one of them. But then again, on the other hand, even when you are covering one of them, you're still getting what feels like very full surround sound. It's the best set of speakers on a foldable. It's just not the best set of speakers on a phone. Like the Asus ROG phones are crazy. So overall, I can't help but like the OnePlus Open. It's not perfect. I wouldn't say this single-handedly fixes the foldable, and it definitely loses a few points for stability right now. But the specs are world-class, the software is genuinely innovative, the cameras are up there, and it has the battery to back it all up, with the cherry on top being the fact that it's also more affordable than the market leader Samsung. Let me hand that to you. Okay, so I've talked about the Opera browser before, about how the way that it's animated and the way that it lets you organize is very appealing to me. But there's a new perk and it comes into play when you're buying stuff. So I was shopping online for a gift last week and it's already really helpful because you can group all of your, let's say Amazon tabs into one tab island and all your eBay tabs into another and keep it really clean. But there's now another layer to it. I just recently bought the pay-per-view to watch the KSI versus Tommy Fury boxing match. And I realized Opera now has a baked in reward scheme where they've partnered with a whole load of companies Companies like eBay and AliExpress and Booking.com, literally hundreds of companies. And then this new scheme allows you to click this badge that appears in your address bar to earn money through cashback while you spend online. So download the Opera browser from my link in the description. It's the best browser for people who A, want to keep trying new innovative features and also people who really want to make the browser their own.